uh, as you see in your program, uh, my name is Martin Palouš, and I was asked to chair this uh, last panel of uh, this year's Václav Havel Conference for Price Human Rights. And the theme for our discussion is human rights and democracy. Uh, before I will introduce our three uh, distinguished panelists, uh, let me to uh, say a couple of uh, uh, words myself, how I understand the problem and uh, what should be the range of our discussion. First, I asked myself, human rights and democracy, do they go together? And obviously our intuitive and immediate answer is yes, of course. Uh, they belong together, they cannot be easily separated from each other. And if we as Czech and Slovak citizens, most of us gathered here, are serious about ourselves, we should remember what our constitution says in its preamble. We, the citizens of the Czech Republic, uh, as a free democratic state based on the respect for human rights and principles of civic society. Free and democratic state, best, uh, uh, state based on the respect for human rights and the principles of civil society. Which means that in the opening part uh, of our constitution in which uh, the basic values are defined, human rights and democracy is part of who we are. But obviously, not only us here in the Czech Republic, but uh, everywhere in the world, we say yes to the question whether human rights and democracy go together, but. And what this but is uh, uh, based upon? It's certainly based upon our historical experience with ourselves, but uh, with the uh, historical experience at large. Actually, the relationship between human rights and democracy is one of the very important questions we uh, should be aware of and we should uh, be able to keep asking again and again. And if I am just to give you some basic orientation point in this discussion, what I would say first is that uh, human rights have or are supposed to have uh, origin in our human nature. They are perceived as uh, uh, atemporal, as uh, unalienable. Uh, they are supposed to be universal and in that sense absolute. They are supposed to be transcending our uh, uh, human, uh, concrete human situation. Even when Jan Patočka in his uh, uh, still very actual and important text what Charter 77 is and what it is not when he speaks about uh, the Human Rights Conventions he is using the word sacred. Uh, so we must be aware of that dimension uh, when we want to speak about human rights. Uh, if I said that human rights are of natural origin I would say that democracy is typical temporal thing. Uh, democracy is always very intimately connected with its uh, concrete origin in time and space. We could go in my, our mind back to the real origins of democracy in ancient Greece, and then we can go through other transformations to democracy, let's say modern state and maybe the state of democracy now. And we always would be saying that democracy is always fragile always unstable, uncertain, and vulnerable. Uh, democracy certainly uh, has uh, created democratic system of government, but I would rather uh, emphasize the processual nature of democracy. This, uh, uh, what I'm saying now, is a part of a debate on democracy today. Actually, I uh, watched on CNN uh, two nights ago, I think it was Condoleezza Rice who were uh, commenting on this current issue in the United States, uh, the football players kneeling uh, and not standing uh, when the national anthem. 
uh, played uh, before uh, their, uh, uh, their tournaments or their games. Uh, and uh, Condoleezza Rice always said, we know that our democracy is not perfect, has never been perfect and will never be perfect. But it always needs uh, uh, people who are uh, determined to defend democracy, who want to make it more perfect uh, than it is in the current moment. In our case, uh, I always remember beautiful comment by Masaryk uh, when he finally was elected president of Czechoslovakia in 1918. So he said, so we have democracy now, and what we need is Democrats. And uh, so we always uh, are in this situation. We were in this situation in the past, and we are in this situation today. What it means is that democracy is uh, something uh, intimately connected with our history, with the historicity of human condition, with the fact that human condition, on the one hand, is stable. We are, we are all uh, humans all the time, but we are living in the changing and ever-changing circumstances. We can see that uh, very clearly in the state of debate on democracy and human rights today in the United States. I think Josh Morakchik has made beautifully this case today. We have the same questions, maybe slightly different historical circumstances in Europe today, in the Czech Republic and in other European countries. And with, we have this question, obviously, in the world. There is a one thing that has not been mentioned today, which is not a uh, real uh, focus today, but there is one very specific human right uh, that uh, uh, is specific because it cannot be, uh, by definition, an individual right. This is the right for self-determination, uh, now being discussed in the Catalonia in a very uh, concrete case, and we might be puzzled and we may have a different opinions. How do we root, uh, read the state of human rights in Spain and Catalonia and uh, position of uh, individuals who are claiming their rights in this particular country. So uh, it's very clear that democracy is in crisis. Democracy, in my view, must be in crisis because democracy, which is not in crisis, would be, uh, in my view, a little bit suspect democracy uh, because democracy should be able to give us opportunity for new beginnings. New beginnings in the moment of every election cycle, but this might be still too static. Uh, we need to have democracy helping us to, new, to make new beginnings in the world, which is changed and which is still changing around ourselves as we speak today. We have traditional liberal solutions. We can discuss and applaud, but these solutions can lead to, I would say, short-sighted uh, conclusions like America first in the United States and recommendation that we all should take, for, uh, take care first about us, about our own democracy, about our own democracy and human rights, which means maybe to close ourselves in a beautiful Czech world of Czech democracy and uh, do anything possible only uh, uh, not to allow anyone uh, to make our situation uh, more difficult than it is right now. But the question, quite consistent with the spirit of democracy, is uh, what's going around in the world today? What is that new thing which we should be uh, aware of to really defend the relationship between human rights and democracy? In the beginning of the 20th century, rather after the First World War, or during the First World War, uh, American President Woodrow Wilson uh, launched the idea of worlds to be made safe for democracy. And uh, I would rather extend this question, and now I will come to present our panelists uh, to broader question. Uh, if we are determined to make worlds safe for democracy, what can democracy or what can democracies do to help all others? 
who live also in this world with those who are part of democratic systems. How they can do it? Does it mean that uh, those other parts of the world should be seen as an object of our uh, activity, uh, entities uh, with our solutions to be imposed on them? Or how eventually enabling environment can be created that everybody in this world can be part of a certain basic agreement that is, uh, I think, in the depth of human rights discourse, because we are all human beings, after all, endowed by the God with certain unalienable rights, and who deserve to be recognized with our uh, human dignity. Anna Arendt, when she uh, um, uh, was pu uh, publishing uh, the second edition of her Origins of Totalitarianism, uh, ended this second edition with the uh, following remark, that mankind today needs a new social contract. Uh, because uh, uh, what she was observing was certain undercurrents uh, that uh, went to the surface in the context of the European civilization. And she meant Holocaust, she meant all these tragedies connected with horrors of totalitarianism. And this time, uh, the part of this contract should not be Europeans only. We must also uh, take not only into consideration, but as our genuine equal partners in debate uh, about this contract or others, uh, or other civilizations or other continents. When Václav Havel was speaking here about human rights, not only here, but also in Brussels or Strasbourg, he always was aware of this contractual aspect of human rights, which means that uh, it's hard to impose certain instruments on others who are not part of certain uh, agreement. But he always believed that uh, this type of uh, social action, interaction with all others is possible, and he also believed that it is very timely to discuss what such a contract that would enable us, all of us, to live in democracy with the respect of human rights altogether. So with that uh, said, let me to introduce those who will hopefully help me to shed some lights uh, on these questions. First, yes, Annie Yang. Annie Yang is a Chinese former labor camp inmate and Falun Gong practitioner now based in the United Kingdom. A graduate of the Beijing Institute of Technology University, she worked for a state company before starting an antique business after China began opening up to the West. In 2005, she was arrested for her involvement in the Falun Gong spiritual movement, whose members the Chinese Communist Party began to persecute in 1999. She received two years in a forced labor camp without a trial, and during her detention was tortured and deprived of basic human rights. Following international pressure, she was released six months early and moved to the UK in 2006, leaving her family behind. She has not been back to China since. Then we have David Eubank. David Eubank is the founder and leader of the Free Burma, Rangers, a humanitarian service movement for oppressed ethnic minorities of all races and religions in the Burma, Iraq, Kurdistan, Syria, and Sudan war zones. A former U.S. Army Special Forces and Rangers officer, he says that along with relief, his personal mission is to share the love of Jesus Christ and help people to be free from oppression. FBR teams are comprised of men and women of different ethnicities and faiths that are united for freedom by bond of love and service. Mr. Eubank, his wife Karen, and their children work alongside the 70 ethnic FBR relief teams in the conflict areas of Burma. They recently also began relief missions to help the Iraqis, Syrians, and Kurds under attack by ISIS in Iraq. The FBR also conducts relief missions in the Nuba Mountains of Sudan. The Eubank family started the Global Day of Prayer for Burma and the Good Life Club Family Outreach Program. And last, but certainly not least, is Roland Oliphant. 
Ronald Tolinspan is the Daily Telegraph senior foreign correspondent. He previously covered Russia, Ukraine, and the former Soviet Union as the paper's Moscow correspondent, reporting extensively on the war in the East Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea. He holds an MA in philosophy from the University of Edinburgh. These are our three panelists. Without further ado, I will ask Anne to start. It is my great honor to thank be here job. today. And I would like to thank everyone involved in organizing this event and giving me this opportunity to talk about human rights in China and to share my story persecuted, being persecuted in China. Today I just focus on my own personal experience. What is a Falun Gong? Falun Gong is a spiritual exercise based on the principles of truthfulness compassion and the tolerance. But however, it's been persecuted in China since 1999 in July till now. In the, on the 4th of March 2005, I was arrested at home. Seven or eight men came into my house. Only one man was in the police uniform and the rest of them all with uh, plain clothes. They didn't show any of their ID and uh, rest of warrant arrested me. And then without trial, I was given two years of forced labor camp. As a labor camp, what they do is force us to renounce our belief they use all kinds of the method in order to let us to give up our belief. Being a human, we have to eat, we have to drink, we have to sleep and go to the toilet. But all these basic human rights were taken away. First, every meal, every day, the meal I only gave equally like one slice of bread with two tablespoons of Chinese porridge which made with rice and water. And uh, when I was at the labor camp, the temperature was 40 degrees. So I only gave maximum 500 millimeters water to drink for 24 hours. So when I feel thirsty, I can only use this water to wipe my lips. I was not allowed to go to bed to sleep. Each day, only two hours or three hours, maximum four hours. And I was forced at daytime to sit on the stool, which is a 30 square centimeter. There is a very basic rule to sitting there. The knee must be closed, the feet have to be closed, and the back have to be very straight, and not allowed to close my eyes. Sitting there for over 20 hours a day. Without permission, I was not allowed to move a little bit. The police use police guard at the labor camp use drug addicts to, to watch me, monitor me 24 hours a day. And three drug addicts in turn, each of them eight hours. So if I want to drink water, I need permission from these drug addicts. I want to drink. If they say yes, and then I can pick up the cup and the drink. After drinking, I need another permission to put the cup back. So every movement, I need permission. I never go to toilet on time. If I want to go to toilet, 
I have to wait a minimum half an hour or sometimes two hours. These which lead my bladder in pain, and later I didn't have a feeling whether I have a urine or not. These are drug, drug addicts, they have to write down everything, what my face expression, what time I drink the water, how much I drink the quantity, and what time I go to the toilet, how about my urine, and its color, the white or yellow, everything. Under the 40 degree, I was not allowed to wash myself, to change my clothes. So two years, two day, two weeks after, I start a hunger strike without water and the drink, water and the food, then I allowed to wash myself finally. Because of I didn't have enough food and water and also sleep, I was faint a few times. And then the police guard giving me these appeals to in order to destroy my central nerves and in order to force me to renounce my belief. Every day I was sit, sitting there, thinking about, thought about how to commit a suicide. The worst thing is, they also asked me to be a spy in England, that's before I was sentenced. And they said, if you promise, like to be, to work for us, you could be released immediately without sentence. And I refused. I would rather serve my two years sentence. The worst thing is, when I was at the labor camp, I gave a body check every three months. On the one hand, they tortured me. And on the other hand, they gave me body check every three months. I didn't understand why until in the 2006, 2006, after I was, I was released, I came to England and I found out they harvest organs from living Falun Gong practitioners. Because being a Falun Gong practitioner, we don't drink, we don't smoke, and we exercise. This is the way how they torture Falun Gong practitioners. They put in the cage like a one square, uh, this uh, high, and also another way. This is another way they torture. The rest of the picture is horrible. If you're frightened, please close your eyes. This woman, you know, seven or eight policemen use electric button to shock her face. All her face is burned. She died years ago. And also use this electric button to beat this uh, Falun Gong practitioner. You use this uh, uh, cigarette to burn them. This lady, we were at the same labor camp, same team. Her room is just next to me, next to mine. She died. The couple married nine years. By the time they've been together, only half a year. They both are Falun Gong practitioners. So when she released, he was arrested and sentenced. When he was released, she was arrested and sentenced. This is uh, the books investigated by the two David Kugel and David Matas from Canada. They investigate for years about organ harvesting, systematically harvest Falun Gong practitioners' organs. And this also Ethan Gatman. If you like to read it, you can find it from the, the Amazon. And this is the picture before the persecution, the Falun Gong in China. So Falun Gong is not only the group were persecuted in China nowadays. The Uyghurs, Tibetans, and uh, 
Christians and also students asking for democracy. So it's a large group. This is a human rights lawyer, Gao Zhisheng, just because uh, he defined it for practitioners and he was severely tortured and now he's missing again. He was arrested by missing again. His where, whereabouts is unknown right at the moment. This is a useful web link. If you like to uh, know more about it, this uh, Doctors Against Foggen Harvesting and uh, Ann Og Pilligen, Falun Dafa Information Center, you will find more information there. How can you help? It's a signed petition on this uh, DAFO website, and please contact your MP representatives and tell your friends and the family not to go to China to get their organ transplanted. Let more people know. And uh, we hope is uh, the government around the world can issue the regulation from the, the, their citizens going to China to the, get their organs. All right, thank you very much, thank you. Thank you very much, and now David. Thanks. Do, do I need this? Is this okay? All right. Well, thank you, and I'm sorry for your friends. And I'm grateful you had a chance to talk and remind us what's happening in China. God bless you. We, I'm Dave Eubank, and we've been in Burma 24 years. We have 70 relief teams in Burma, but the last three years, we've taken some of those teams to Iraq, Syria, to help people under attack by ISIS. So our efforts are at the very grassroots level. And I was trying to think what would be useful for a discussion like this, and you're operating at a high level, which is important. And so I think I'm just gonna share a couple experiences which I think are fundamental to human rights and democracy. And one is a question I ask myself, what's the difference between justice and vengeance? One of the tenets of democracy and human rights is justice, justice for everyone. But when you see injustice, there's two paths. One driven by anger and hate, other driven by love. And one of them ends up at, law, at justice, and that's the way of love. And the way of vengeance ends up no justice. And these are some words. But in the last eight months, my family and I have been in Mosul. I've been in the very front line. I was shot once, grenaded three times. My translator was killed next to me. I lost 30 close friends. Of one of the battalions I served with, Iraqis, we lost from 500 down to 27 men. That's a lot of dead people. I had people shot in my arms. None of that, and I fought ISIS this close, two meters, looking at each other. None of that made me hate ISIS. None of it. Until they killed a three-year-old girl that just minutes before was holding on my leg after we liberated a neighborhood saying, "Ameriki, Ameriki." When that girl died, something changed in my heart. And I thought, I'm going to hunt these guys down forever. That's it. And I called it justice. And in the morning, I'm, I'm not an American soldier anymore. I used to be. I'm with the Iraqis now. But in the morning, I opened the Bible, and it said, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. And I thought, oh, what I called justice was vengeance. And it would have eaten me alive with hate. And I said, Jesus, forgive me. And I went forward. I didn't quit. I went forward, but without hate. And I learned a lesson that day. Hate would have eventually crushed me. And when you're in situations where human rights are being abused, it's difficult not to hate. You have a right to hate. They've killed your loved ones like they've killed yours. They've tortured you. They've, they shot me. They tried to kill my kids. But that's no solution. So I think fundamental in human rights is the concept of justice, but it's only attainable with love. 
That's the first thing. The second thing, as we're with the Iraqi army, which is mostly Shia, fighting ISIS, all of a sudden ISIS families who are Sunni are breaking free. And then ISIS begins to shoot them down. Some of you may have seen the videotape of us behind a tank, a Iraqi tank. I'm running out to try to catch this girl. I wasn't the only one who did that. Iraqi soldiers did it, and many of them died. And when I asked them afterwards, after we rescued some Sunni kids, why are you doing this? That's your enemy's children. And they said, Allah teaches us to be merciful. Number two, if we Shia don't help Sunni children, we will fight forever. And that was another lesson. And it goes back again to love. And the last story I have to say, and, and my point of this is to say that this is operating at a very small level but it's, I think, the only way forward when you're trying to change society. You need the governmental support, but you've got to get in there and do it. We're with Sunni families in Badush, which is just outside of Mosul. And we've liberated the area, but they're all ISIS supporters. For six weeks, there was nothing done against these people. We gave them food, water, medical supplies. My children were there riding horses with them. And after six weeks, they became friendly. On the seventh week, they pointed out two people that were sitting like right there. They were ISIS leaders in their community. And the Iraqi general was furious. He said, we've been with you for six weeks, and just now you turn these guys in? And they said, we needed to know, one, are you staying? And two, are you just? Then we'll turn them in. And so those are just some stories from my experience that without justice, you will not have democracy, you will not have human rights. But to attain justice, we need love. And love is always available for all of us. So that's my contribution to this meeting. Well, well it's yours. Um, I really noticed it's bloody wire. Um, so, human rights and democracy. Um, I suppose there's, there's, as a journalist, um, I'm a bit of a skeptic about a lot of things. Um, I, I don't like to think of myself as some kind of um, campaigner or, or anything like that. I like to just um, be an observer, really. Um, so I suppose there's, there's a couple of things I say. First of all, um, it's a great honor to be standing alongside people like this who've um, and, and the people who've spoken at this event who, who make fighting for human rights um, something, you know, something serious, something that they are really committed to. Um, I'm an observer. Um, that's what I do. Secondly, I think um, at the moment in the world, maybe because I'm in news, I think we're in a really dangerous point right now. Um, I, I really think that, um, as you were saying, democracy is transient. Um, it can go very, very easily. It, it, it's, it can vanish. Um, and uh, I think we're seeing this in, in many uh, places around the world. Um, but the main thing, I suppose, is, look, we talk about human rights. Governments shouldn't do this. Governments shouldn't do that. In reality, um, all governments, governments basically abuse people, all right? All governments, the American government, the British government, everyone's guilty of it to some degree. Um, and that's just because the world is messy, right? Um, so, you know, governments want to get things done they're going to trample on someone. That's why we have a court system um, and justice and, and, and a free press and so on. Governments are reluctant to criticize their allies if they're doing it for political reasons. Um, war is hell, even if it's a just war. I mean, David probably knows this better than anyone. You're in Mosul, right? Um, the, the, the death count from allied airstrikes against ISIL, civilian death count, is phenomenal. Um, I think we'd probably mostly agree it's a just war. It's got to be done. Um, those are human rights abuses, it happens. Um, so, you know, things are, things are rough, things are messy, free speech doesn't often work. Um, I can't write anything that I want. The world is not, a, you know, a, a fairy tale. Um, but that said, um, you know, things... Uh, <laughs> what am I trying to get to here? Um, we kind of muddle along, right? In a democracy, we kind of muddle along. We just about get it right. Um, sometimes it doesn't work. And most of my career was in Russia. I suppose I just want to talk about the, the Russian experience, really, of, of where uh, a democracy basically failed. Um, 
and I don't know if it's necessarily to do with human rights, but it's, it's about those compromises we make every day. Right? So, okay, war is hell, um, we're bombing ISIS, we're going to end up killing civilians, that's something we have to manage. Um, in Russia, there were similar kinds of compromises. Um, and the end of democracy in Russia really began, I think, in 1993. Um, people talk about Vladimir Putin, how he's destroyed democracy. The real trouble in Russia began in 1993. Um, and the reason was that President Yeltsin had an argument with Parliament. And he ended up shelling it. A lot of people died. Um, he basically crushed parliamentary democracy in Russia and imposed the constitution, which we have today with a couple of tweaks, um, which gives Vladimir Putin a, a great amount of power. Um, the reason he did that, Russian liberals will tell you, was to stop a red-brown putsch, to stop a seizure of power by extreme leftists, communists, and basically Nazis. And they say, well, he had to do it. Okay. 1996, a few years later, to cut a long story short, Yeltsin basically kind of stole an election. Um, again, what was the alternative? The communists were going to win that election. A lot of liberals said, well, okay, do we want the Soviet Union back? Those were, a lot of people saw those as compromises that, that, that were necessary at the time. Um, they basically destroyed um, any kind of real semblance of Russian democracy, and we are where we are today in Russia, which I think is fair to say is basically an authoritarian state um, because of that. So I think, um, apologies for my very you know, bitty thoughts. Um, the main thing I think, uh, the main point to make is that those compromises can lead us, I suppose, to, um, uh, to losing democracies. But I've never seen a case, I can't think of a case, where that happened simply because of the compromise, simply because, okay, we have to fight with ISIS or, or we have to limit our rights uh, because we're fighting terrorism or something like that. There tends to be an intention. There tends to be somebody who is trying to gather power. There tends to be someone who just doesn't believe in democracy and human rights. Um, it doesn't just happen. Um, so I suppose the lesson, if, if, I'm, if I'm to talk about lessons and things, is, is simply to be vigilant and not to take that for granted. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. So we heard uh, three introductory statements, and uh, let me to formulate uh, two points uh, and uh, ask you to uh, react uh, to them. Uh, first, um, I think uh, uh, Professor Lomova was right, very much so, when he tried to wake us from a certain illusion, uh, illusion that if we want to isolate ourselves from human rights of others. For instance, uh, because we want to have good re business relationships with China, uh, that it has uh, no effect on our own democracy. And if we believe that our own human rights are connected with our democracy, uh, then we have a, a real causal chain uh, that we don't want to see happening. Uh, I just uh, would like to remind you, it's the 40th anniversary of Charter 77, and I think that the basic uh, human rights argument of Charter 77 40 years ago was uh, that uh, uh, we have certain moral obligations, not only uh, to enforce human rights as an ever-expanding catalog of our own rights, it's very true that in the today's world it's sometimes very difficult uh, to uh, have a basic orientation how many rights we are supposed to have. But uh, uh, to be able to hear and respond to the basic call to defend uh, the right of others if we feel that some injustice is being made. So my first question is, obviously, it's always very good if you hear that there are some people expressing solidarity with uh, your fight or with the fight of those who you've met in all sorts of battlefields of today. But still, I think that these people might feel a little bit left uh, behind 
uh, uh, turned into sacrifice for our relatively luxurious uh, life uh, in uh, uh, the West. And uh, uh, actually now our democracy has a tendency to uh, just keep them out uh, and eventually to build some walls uh, so that they are not disturbing our peace here today. The second point, uh, um, uh, I'm now going to speak as a former diplomat. It's obvious that states uh, have and will have a very important role here and that states have certain way of doing things and that this uh, principle of non-intervention into domestic matters of other states makes a lot of sense uh, and it was not uh, only uh, intended when the drafters of uh, uh, UN Charter uh, were discussing uh, the new uh, uh, world order as an instrument in the hands of totalitarian, authoritarian governments just how to uh, uh, keep their space protected for their own, uh, I would say, uh, criminal uh, operations within their zone of influence. What you would be expecting uh, from international community, uh, which uh, is community of states, uh, to, as a more effective action on uh, uh, the behalf of people you are uh, talking about. Obviously, political realists and spirit of uh, 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 them uh, would be saying we first need to respect realities and realities of power is what matters and stability between global uh, players is uh, the first thing of our concern. But uh, how we can really uh, convince uh, international community to be more effective and I would say morally more responsible uh, when confronted with the situations like people you are representing here. Can you give us some advice? Uh, I don't really have uh, any advice. Uh, the thing is, uh, China's economy become really more and more powerful, but the human rights are really getting worse and worse. And uh, lots of government know, understand this situation just because of the trade, because of the money, they don't want to publicly condemn this persecution. That's a horrible thing, to, really, to do, yeah. David? I, I agree with you. You have a new brother now. <laughs> um, I, I think about this idea of intervention versus non-intervention. It's not possible. We're all intervening all the time with each other. I'm an American. I'm in Czech Republic. You're English, I think. You're Chinese. Here we are. We're, we're going to intervene with each other all the time. And humans always have. The only question is, what's your motive? And I think we have a role, regardless of your government or academia or another walk of life, we all have a role to decide together what is our motive. And I believe that when our motive is love, then we have a way. Some people will not respond to that. The Nazis, love alone was not going to get them out of here. That took force. Same with ISIS. But most people, there is a way. And so I think we need to, as much as we can, you cooperate. I'm speaking as an American now. We got a lot of power. But the point isn't to dominate, it's to cooperate. And I think if your motive is love, you can find a way that's mutually beneficial. And I think you have to just keep working at it. You can't just sit back and pretend it's going to stay there. So, and I think the second part of that is what you were asking earlier about can you have immorality or amorality internationally and morality at home? I think impossible. You can't treat people without democracy over there and without human rights it will affect you here. It will infect you here. So I think they all go together. I, I don't really think much. I mean, faith in the international community. I mean, um, that's just, I mean, that's crazy, isn't it? Um, I mean, how could we make the international? I suppose what you're talking about is persuading um, democratic Western nations to be a bit more forceful. 
largely speaking. And when I say that, it's because, you know, we, we talk about the international community. Okay, what's the international community? Well, it's embodied in the United Nations, right? Um, every country has a veto. So people complain about the United Nations not doing anything. Well, that's because, you know, Russia and China have vetoes um, and so on. So, as you know, as a diplomat, right, the, the, the practicalities are really difficult. Um, persuading governments to take more action. Um, I think there's a role for, for campaigners, um, publicity, um, the media, and so on and so forth. Um, but there's, uh, there's another issue here, right? Um, the reason there's one, one reason um, that some governments take a very dim view of, of the notion of human rights is because they see it as basically a battering ram for, for Western interests. Not entirely unreasonably, right? Um, I mean, that was, that was, that was basically a, t a tool of the Cold War, right? And the, the, the Reagan administration made great use of that um, to basically discredit Soviet power. Um, so if, if you talk to people like, um, talk to the kind of people like, I don't, I don't speak to Vladimir Putin, right? Um, I would love the interview, never gonna happen. I've asked. <laughs> so maybe the New York Times, not Telegraph, sad. Um, it's not that they're, they just, they're not part of this conversation because they just don't believe in it. Well, what are you talking about? Human rights, are you taking us for fools? Right? They just, they think in terms of national interests um, and their interests. And the moment governments start talking about things like, you know, human rights and so on, all they see is um, a Western government finding an excuse to get something that they want. That's the attitude. Um, so I like the idea of like, you know, love and cooperation, we can find something. It's pretty difficult, I, you know, when, when that's the attitude on the other side. Um, really cynical. I mean, they, they'd hear what you were saying and say, right, this guy's either an idiot or he's, he's basically bullshitting me. You know. Well, then I would counter them saying, your system doesn't work. It's, you can put all this power and try to manipulate people and move things around. It only works temporarily. And you cannot show in history or over the long term force and taking away human rights works. It doesn't. It has a, and, and that's the only counter you have. And finally, I, I, don't, I don't, you know, I was going to take a, I agree with you. Absolutely brutal. That's why in the end, you've said your piece, you've got to do your job. And you, I love how you do yours. But maybe I'm going to shift it a little bit to see, say I saw something that I thought worked in parts of Syria and Iraq. Maybe it wasn't the plan, but I saw it. And that was in eastern Iraq, where the, I mean, eastern Syria where the Kurds were, and parts of Iraq, there's a coalition, mostly Americans, air, aircraft, and resources. The fighting is done on the ground by the Kurds in Syria and by the Iraqis in Iraq, not Americans. But in the air, there's power. Because of that presence, it created a space where the PUK Kurds, the PDK Kurds, the Kurds and the Iraqis then did not fight each other. And to me, that was a positive, talking about what big powers can do. I know it's a small case, but that's a positive result of big powers there where they know if they want those aircraft, if they want these resources, they can't fight each other, which then made a space to talk. Now it's being tested. You have the Kurds had a referendum, the Iraqis don't agree, um, the West has kind of been quiet, I, and I think this is the time not to be quiet, but that's, that's one thing I saw that worked. Sure. <coughs> and I, I think you just got to keep battering at, at Putin and his friends. I like, I like, I like this. I mean, I mean I'm, I, sorry, just very okay, quickly, I, mean, I, have, I have a pretty, <laughs> I have a dim view of everything really, um, people governments, you know. Um, but you're right, it's, it's about incentives, right? Governments do things because they've got incentives, you give them the incentive. And of course, I mean, the Russian government, um, you know, they're, they're not like inherently evil. Some people would say they're like, not, they're just, you know, they're, 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 they've got their interests and so on. So they will, they will systematically um, oppose any kind of intervention anywhere, largely on principle, because they see that as a, as a threat, basically, because they think, one day it's going to be us, um, which is why they, for, for example, would oppose intervention in, in Burma, for example, with the Rohingya crisis. That's, that's their principle. Um, they intervened, intervened in Syria right, because there's an interest there. And you could make a case, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's that, 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 you know, the Russians have contributed to defeating ISIS in, in, in some sense. So 
yeah, finding finding incentives for governments. Governments will follow incentives, and I think um, you know that's that's one answer. You know, uh, but uh, I think that now we would be tempted uh, to arrive at a very pessimistic. Uh, uh, conclusion concerning the relationship between democracy and human rights. Uh, we will have election here in this country uh, two weeks from now, or even less, uh, and uh, following uh, uh, Friday, Saturday. And uh, it looks like uh, that uh, the arguments uh, uh, that are or have been criticized here would uh, be very effective in drawing, uh, drawing um, votes, uh, or people would agree with that. As Josh Moravchik said, uh, uh, the problem is uh, uh, once this, uh, but, uh, uh, once, uh, once the, these things become too much politicized. Uh, if politicians uh, in democratic countries uh, discover that the best thing how to win their case is uh, to, um, I would say, cultivate the worst uh, uh, within their own societies. Uh, so the question is what can be done? What kind of education, wake-up call, uh, can help people uh, to realize that Professor Lomova is right when she says that their human rights are connected with the question of uh, human rights of uh, these people in China. Whether they are silent when someone says here that the best thing for us is to have a positive balance of uh, foreign trade and to make business with China is a great thing, then even in the context of economic pragmatic rationalism, rationality, you have uh, doubts uh, because to make uh, deals with uh, authoritarian governments sometimes uh, create very poor and very bad results. Democracy, I think, also has some uh, role to play in economic uh, uh, decisions, and I can go on and on. Uh, so the question is, what we can do to, I would say, correct uh, sometimes unfortunate relationship between democracy too much dependent on politics uh, uh, of um, irresponsible populist leaders that like to disseminate in our time slogans uh, uh, to aggrandize themselves and to detriment of their own country, I think is the word, word of uh, uh, federalist I think we've had papers. An though, right? That's uh, the question. But that, but that, but that's, that was answered brilliantly this morning by Owen's speech, and it's all about that, that memory thing is really, uh, you were talking about the, 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 the duty to remember, don't forget, that is so important. Um, and, okay, I spent most of my adult life in Russia, so all my stories are gonna go back there, basically. Um, if you drive west of Moscow, um, basic, basically west, southwest, anywhere, um, basically until you get, you know, to Berlin, you stop in any village, you're gonna find a mass grave. Uh, it, it, it's insane. and. Um, I was, I, I, I've, I've reported on, on very, you know, you do stories, um, I, I went to report on Chernobyl, right, on the anniversary of the nuclear blast, so on a very grim story in its own right. Um, you get to Chernobyl, interviewed a guy about, um, about, you know, being from Chernobyl and the nuclear blast and so on and so forth, um, and it turned out he was a very old guy, and he started telling me about his life, I was like, do you remember the war? He goes, yeah, yeah, I, I saw them shoot the Jews, come again. Yeah, down by the bus station. I saw it. Nobody who worked there in Chernobyl, the staff, there's a lot of people who, 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 um, who work at the power station, decommissioning and so on, nobody knew about this. We asked around, like the, the, bus, the mass grave at the bus station, right? this old guy saw it, he said he saw it himself. Um, he saw them, saw you know, the men from the women, lie them in an anti-tank ditch and kill them. We found it, it's there, there's a little block, little white, um, whitewashed concrete block, pretty forgotten. Um, I think some guys from Israel came over and placed a memorial. Sites like that are all over um, Eastern Central Europe. You know, the Czech Republic doesn't need to be reminded of that, right? Um, it's so important not to forget um, where this can lead, where, where exactly, exactly what um, Erwin was saying, talking about how, you know, it didn't start in the gas chambers, it starts with words. Um, so I'm all about education, history, um, especially, you know, people like you coming out and, and telling people really uncomfortable things about really horrendous things that are going on all the time. That's, that's my answer.
I think another issue I like to talk about is because of the Western investment does give a Chinese government and they have money to use it to persecute their citizens. Without money, they can't do it. And I, I think in answer to your question, that's why we're here. The academics among you, you have a opportunity to prove, and I think you can prove it, that human rights and democracy is finally good for business. That's something you can, I think you can put that together. Diplomats, you have a, an opportunity to remind countries of the, that their interest is of the people's rights. You have an opportunity, as you just did right now, to remind us of things that have happened. You to tell your stories. I can speak from my experiences, and whether it's Burma or other places. So I think one of the purposes of this gathering is to share this, to remind each other we're not alone as some kind of lone crusader, that this is a worthy endeavor and change does happen, otherwise we couldn't sit here. And I think that is one of the opportunities and solutions and why we're here together. You know, but still we have an uh, opportunity or even obligation right. to ask our governments uh, uh, to uh, pay proper attention uh, to these questions. Uh, uh, you can discuss here in the Czech Republic uh, how far uh, the government uh, now in Prague has uh, gone from, let's say, uh, the tradition of Václav Havel in that uh, respect. I would be less pessimistic, uh, maybe that some people but, uh, believe. I think that still this spirit is here and that uh, we still have a, I would say, positive, uh, um, we have an opportunity uh, to keep certain tradition alive. But there must be uh, cr creativity, uh, uh, fantasy, and opportunity uh, to do that. Uh, and obviously, this one uh, is a very important forum, but it's uh, already a group of people who are convinced, and we need to find a way how to send our message to those who might still have some doubts and creativity and knowledge how to uh, keep our message uh, out from out of their um, uh, sphere of action. Political realists are important uh, because we all need to take realities into consideration before we have some realistic plans. But still, uh, this message uh, and. Jan Patočka, Czech philosopher, also of a uh, uh, spokesperson for Charter 77, uh, called that spirit solidarity of the shaken, of those uh, who, because they made certain experience, uh, got uh, in touch with people uh, in a certain difficult situation, cannot forget uh, about this experience and need to build some common space uh, in which all these people can live. Patočka says that all others, uh, all these engineers uh, who are sitting on the sidelines are living from the blood of others, which is something what we certainly don't want to support. Okay, let's open it for uh, the general discussion. I hope that uh, there is someone here with microphone and that there are some questions, comments, contributions. Michael. Uh, all right, I would like to thank all the panelists for uh, uh, a lot of food for thought uh, on these issues. But I have a specific question which uh, has been worrying me for, for some time. Uh, uh, originally, uh, there was uh, a guest of honor to speak at the conference at this time and uh, her name is Aung San Suu Kyi, and she had to cancel her visit to Prague 10 days ago uh, because uh, of uh, the situation in, in Myanmar. And, uh, and those of us who know a little but not a lot about uh, Myanmar uh, are well aware of the constraints she's uh, uh, working under and uh, of uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, hers is not the only, or her government is not the only power in, in Myanmar that is operating uh, there. And uh, many of us harbor 
a deep admiration for uh, uh, Lady Aung San Suu Kyi and the work she has done. At the same time, there seems to be no doubt about the plight of the Rohingyas uh, uh, group in, in northern uh, Myanmar and about the human rights abuses that uh, had uh, taken place there. And uh, this is something of uh, also of a general uh, issue and, and question. Sometimes we uh, give uh, a lot of uh, the benefit of the doubt to uh, young uh, regimes uh, on the assumption that they are sincerely working uh, towards uh, democracy or that they will eventually work towards democracy. Uh, Cuba is another case in, in, in point in this. Uh, and uh, we tend to overlook uh, very real uh, problems and a very real human rights uh, abuses that uh, have taken place. And since I know that you all have covered uh, uh, Myanmar and Burma, or worked in Burma, or taken interest in, in, in Myanmar, I, I uh, wonder what your uh, thinking on the dilemma uh, would be. Thank you. Gentlemen. Well, yeah. Well, first, uh, we have someone from the Irrawaddy in the very back, which he's a real Burman and he knows a lot more than I do. So if you want to pitch in after me or after us, or if you have a question, there's a real hero back there. But my, this is my, um, my understanding of Burma. For us, we've been there 24 years. My children are raised there in the conflict areas, not visa or passport. We're walking. First of all, the fight against the ethnics has not stopped. Up in northern Burma, Kachin State, northern Shan State, that the Ang, constant attacks, airstrikes almost every week. Right now, we have teams up there. Other parts of Burma, there are ceasefires, and it's measurably better. But I think important to understand is that when you have an election in America or in the Czech Republic, it's based on the people. And that's the foundation, good president or bad. But in Burma, the military is the foundation this democracy is built on. So Aung San Suu Kyi has limited power to do almost anything. They let her do anything they agree with, anything they don't agree with, she can't stop the attacks in the north. And so that's the, that's the context that you know, most of you know very well, that it, just because there was an election doesn't mean it's a democracy like you have here. The second part of why she's not being vocal about it, I think one is because it's a very complex issue which involves a group of people that have been insulated from the rest. And there's some legitimate um, wrong on both sides that has made it easy to oppress them. Having said all that, my own personal prayer for Suu Kyi is to follow her conscience. I, and that's not for me to say what it is, because she knows the situation better than I do. And I believe, just from having met her, that she's trying to do that. I don't personally agree the way it's being done, but I still have confidence that she knows a lot more than I do about it. So that's, I'm glad you brought it up because it's a big problem. Over 500,000 Rohingya have now fled. We have relief teams trying to help in a small way. Um, I wish you'd say something back there, but you okay. want to say something? You should say what you told me. Come, come forward. Uh, my name is Aung Zhou. I'm a founder and editor-in-chief of the ARD magazine. We were based in uh, Thailand before. Now we are operating inside Yangon. I think there are a few things I want to add to the, this discussion on Rohingya, Aung San Suu Kyi, and the international response. The first, I think David is right about the army. Army has absolute power. And uh, the Western governments, uh, Western media, they bug up the round tree 
I kept writing editorial and opinion pieces since the violence took place in our country. That because our sensitivity doesn't have a control over the army since the day one, she has a very compromised position to work with the army. And she cannot, or she doesn't, and she don't, and she did not order troops to go to kill those innocent Rohingya people. And when the Western media groups, or what's Western media, or BBC, or VOA, or even New York Times, began to criticize her, saying that her action, or her inaction, or her silence are appalling. In fact, once she misspoke the issue, I will tell you, army will kill her. I think she's now sitting in a very dangerous, precarious position, and very difficult position she's been staying. And if you follow Burma four weeks ago, because of the outbreak of this violence between the, the army and uh, the attacks by the, 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 the Bengali terrorist Rohingya, groups who believe, we believe that we have evidence that received the funding from the Saudi Arabia and other countries, uh, she made a very difficult speech, and balanced speech. If you listen back to her, she spoke in English, and that message was aimed to bring down the uh, tension, also the criticism in, in, in international uh, community to say that she has been working hard to, to reconcile the communities. And I, I think the first thing we have to acknowledge her courage, which is that she invited Kofi Annan, the former UN uh, chief, to chair the uh, uh, Arganese Rakhine Commission to release the recommendations, which has uh, over 80 recommendations. That includes uh, citizenship for the, those Rohingya. Of course, we are not going to call them Rohingya. We will call them, according to the existing laws, as somewhere like Arakanese Muslims or Muslims in Arakan. So this, we cannot do things like ethnicity based in our country because as you know, or you may know that Burma or Myanmar has, we, are, we have over 100 different diverse ethnic people living in our country. So because of that, this issue has been prolonged, and the different governments in the past, the regime, do not, did not have a political will to solve this problem. This is the only time someone came up, invited, and made a brief decision to invite Kofi Annan to release a recommendation for the last two years to work on the issues. The army still did not like it. Army hated her. Army did not believe any foreigners to should come to work on this issue. I think she's just put in a very difficult position. I'm not defending her. I, I don't really like a lot of things that she, what she had done with regard to the uh, issues, a lot of issues going around in our country. But at the same time, I think it's very difficult. The, the lastly, what I want to say is that the, 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 the uh, Western governments and Western media, the way they cover the issue has been very much black and white. And they don't expose, as usual, about nuances, the complexity of the situation on the ground. How can we talk about the issue that lasts for the last decades, over one minute on the BBC and CNN? This is very difficult. But the Western media has been, I mean, I also write for the New York Times and other Guardian and, and, and the Washington Post, that the Western media focus on the hash issue has been very simplistic, a very different kind of colonial attitude, saying that you are wrong, you are wrong, you are wrong. But, without a given ability to teach you as a readers to understand and respect and, and, and the, the issues. So that's, a, that's a, the nuances that we have to understand in, in, in the country. A, a very easy to blame on, on things of what is happening in our country. We are wrestling day and night with the nightmares 
in our country with this Rohingya issue because it's not just Rohingya living or being cracked down, but also there are the links with the some countries in the Middle East who have been funding these this, this militant groups to, to attack and launch uh, this, this Islamic campaign in that region. So there's a lot of nuances to, to cover and talk about it. And of course, army did, did a very expected, brutal army always deaths. When they go to other ethnic villages, David knows, Karen or Shan or Mont, what they do, four things. They walk into the village, they burn down the village, they may rape the girls, they will loot, and they will kill people. That's what they do. And they do the same thing last month when they attack the militants. I think, according to the official figure, about 400 or 500 people were killed. But actually, actual number, I think, is much higher. Maybe 2,000 to 3,000 people were killed. And they are militants. Or there were a lot of collateral damages because of uh, family members and kids and children also will be killed, I, I assume. So there's a fright campaign by, the, by an army launched to attack those people, to prevent the further escalation of violence. So I think there are a lot of nuances to talk about it, not just about black and white saying, oh, Rohingyas are bad, or Rohingyas are good, or poor, or a military is bad, or Aung San Suu is completely like a, you know, she's like a, Return, she should return the, like a Nobel Peace Prize award. This is completely off the mark talking about Suji should return the Peace Prize. No one is asking for it, but I mean, I mean the way that we cover the story is, is very unprofessional and unethical. <coughs> That's what I feel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Would you like to comment on it? Yeah. Um, as a representative of the mainstream <laughs> Western media, um, no, I, I don't necessarily disagree with uh, that, that, that we present a, um, a simple, simplified um, account of what's happening. And that's, I mean, Western media is not perfect, right? We make mistakes. It's the first draft of history. First drafts are messy. Sometimes they have to be corrected. Um, you get it wrong. Um, sadly, we're not all specialists. Um, we try to get specialists um, to explain things to us. Um, often we're trying to explain the, basically the very immediate thing of what's happening. Um, and, and often there, there isn't the space to get in all that nuance. And, and certainly, um, look, Mia Kolpe, you're not the first person I've heard to complain about in whatever region. I mean, you, sh you, should, you should hear what the Ukrainians and the Russians say to me about how I covered their country, because there's a million nuances that, that, that sadly we don't get in. So, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm sure there are things we could have done better. On the other hand, um, I think what's happening is quite clear. I mean, I was, I was just down on, um, on the Bangladeshi side of the border. One reason that it's been difficult to cover that is that um, it was basically impossible for um, independent Western journalists to travel independently in Rakhine. Um, as far as I understand, there was, a, there was a kind of press junket put on by the government. Um, there's no doubt about what's happening. Right? This would be absolutely clear. Um, the UN just put out a report today. I mean, it, it's, it's ethnic cleansing. It looks like, and, and I'd be very interested if you think that, um, that this is what's happening, it, it seems like an attempt to push out the entire Rohingya population. Um, and. Uh, what you just described is exactly what, um, what, what the refugees have described, exactly that pattern of attack. Um, soldiers combined with um, local uh, ethnic uh, Rakhine vigilantes come into a village, burn it down, kill everyone they can, rape the women. Um, systematic. You, you can talk to, the, I mean, I, I talk to, I don't know how many refugees with very, very consistent stories. There's no doubt about what's happening there. Um, I, 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 think, I think that's been presented quite fairly. As to Aung San Suu Kyi, look, I don't know, I'm, I'm quite interested. Well, I, I haven't done that piece yet. We were thinking about that, and it's, it's, it's a debate that goes on, actually. You know, editors, editors are really wondering about, well, what is the answer here? And there have certainly been opinion pieces that I've seen published attacking her. Certainly, I think, is it William Hague, um, former British foreign minister, wrote an opinion piece saying, uh, 
you know, she should, I, th I think it was him, um, you know, she should be stripped of her, of her human rights prize and so on. Um, but I, I, think, I think that's also, you know, in our, in our you know, imperfect way, I think, I think that debate, you know, how much influence does she have, what is the role of the military and so on, um, I think that has been kind of covered. Um, we, we, we try, basically. So, so. Thank you. Another question from, or another intervention from the audience. Josh. This is more of an intervention than a, a question, but it's a, it's a non-answer to the question that, that you raised, uh, Martin, which is about the, uh, uh, in our political life, the calculations of uh, having trade and, and uh, relations with, uh, with authoritarian regimes and uh, uh, whether, uh, you know, at, at what point should we assert human rights as a value and try to uh, make that uh, I intervene uh, or, or, or guide our decisions. And uh, I'm thinking, especially from the U.S. point of view, but perhaps some other countries also, we had a tremendous debate about uh, economic relations with China. And uh, that debate was more than 25 years ago, really. It, 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 it uh, was uh, most intense when uh, Bill Clinton was running for uh, president the first time in 1992. And he was very critical of the predecessor, the first George Bush, for uh, doing business as usual uh, with China, and then when Clinton was in office after a year, he reversed himself. And the argument was, and it was a difficult argument to uh, oppose, the argument was well, that having uh, trade and, and therefore the maximum amount of, uh, of intercourse between the United States and China, or the West in general and, and China, would have a beneficial effect uh, on human rights there because they would have a lot of contact with Westerners and, uh, and relationships, and this would serve to liberalize them. Uh, now we're 25 years later, and uh, the current Chinese uh, government is uh, more repressive and, and uh, uh, less uh, uh, receptive to human rights than the Chinese government was back then. So it seems as if uh, uh, that it may be, and, and there have been similar arguments about Iran, about Russia, it seems as if it's uh, uh, overdue for someone to do some systematic studying of this theory that uh, economic relations uh, uh, will breed greater liberalization in, in closed regimes, or at least to try to understand when it might have that effect and when uh, it might not at all or even have the opposite effect. Well, uh, I think that uh, we can easily add to your uh, example Another one I see, Pedro Fuentes sit, uh, sitting uh, there in the audience, uh, Cuba. Uh, in the past years, uh, uh, we uh, could see uh, the effects of opening uh, of the United States towards uh, the Cuban regime, and obviously uh, policies that don't work should be re-debated or reconsidered, uh, but uh, this opening has not produced much, uh, I would almost dare to say anything uh, when it comes to the nature of the regime and how this regime uh, behaves uh, towards some population. And that's, uh, that's the uh, core issue. I always uh, keep in our memory, our own experience here, Helsinki process started 1975. And it was the process in which all three elements that were discussed here today, which means peace and security, 
economic cooperation, but also human rights and humanitarian issues. Maybe were divided into three different baskets, but uh, still discussed together. And it was essential for Charter 77 uh, to be able to step into this process. But obviously, what was also essential that international community uh, um, uh, was willing and able and ready uh, to uh, listen to the arguments that were coming from our circles here in Czechoslovakia then, or from Poland or from other countries of the region. So that's why I think that it is uh, essentially important that these discourses, uh, human rights uh, activists should not speak only among themselves, but to have an effective form of communication uh, and not only blaming uh, them all the time again and again uh, to all those uh, uh, who are in charge of, I would say, traditional international relations. So what we need to try again and again to send this message out, because this message is, uh, I would say, uh, not only important for those who suffer, but for us, for our own integrity and uh, consistency of our uh, opinions. So uh, I fully I'm on your side, and uh, let's work on this study together. Can I? Yes, please. So, Annie, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, because my, my feeling is that um, this kind of contentment we've had for a long time in the West about how, um, well, you know, liberal capitalist democracy with human rights, like that's the future, and that's the only way you're going to get rich, and so on. Do you feel that China, I mean, China's remarkable economic success over the past several years, has actually kind of shown that that's not true. You can have uh, an authoritarian regime um, that disrespects human rights and be economically successful. And I mean, if so, does that worry you? I, I think it is a completely two different thing. And it's not working like, uh, you know, it's uh, years ago, years ago when the China was going to join the WTO, I think the world put the consideration about the human right. They think, okay, if we open the door uh, to China, yeah, let China join the WTO, maybe their human right could change. It doesn't work that way at all. It doesn't work that way at all. And look, it's a, I, I mean the persecution, whatever persecution the Falun Gong practitioner, Falun Gong of course, is a large group, these innocent people being persecuted. If you look, all these uh, human rights lawyers, the dependent, if they don't have money, they can't do it. So in other ways, the Western invest so much people helping the Chinese government to persecute their citizens. Do you, that's quite depressing. Um, do you see any likelihood or chance of the attitude to human rights in China changing, of the government liberalizing, or is it not going to happen? Uh, it's, it's very hard to predict, to be honest, at the moment, yeah. But I think it's uh, finally they have to change. Maybe their change, not they change themselves, maybe change by the forces, by the something happened in the world or by heaven. You never know, because we Chinese people, general people believe doing good, you will get rewarded. Doing bad, you will get punished. Like uh, all this, uh, at the moment, this anti-craft uh, campaign in China, is all these uh, high-ranking officials, is uh, like Bo Xilai, yeah, Zhou Yongkang, and uh, also head of the military. They were all sentenced now in the stay in the prison. But they are all the key persons to persecute and also launch this persecution of Falun Gong. You want to say something? Okay, so uh, I think that uh, I'm uh, given a signal that our time has run out, so I would like to thank to all three panelists for their excellent contributions. Uh, I would like to thank you for cooperation, and I would especially like to pray and uh, wish you good luck for all those we have been discussing about in these two hours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.